Living long is a real accomplishment these days. Remains to be seen if I end up dying peaceful in my bed. So first things first, I've switched over from playing the Xbox 360 version of New Vegas to a PC copy. Uh, this allows for numerous advantages over its console counterpart, including uh, higher fidelity and easier recording, uh, plus the obvious inclusion of allowing mods. Uh, the only mods currently in the load order besides the official DLC are bug fixes and anti-crash packages. I don't know if I'll be adding anything else in the future, as the dock's original purpose was to get a closer look at what was officially made by Obsidian. At the same time, there is an absolute wealth of free and extra content made by a devoted community, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't uh, tempted to throw a few mods in. Uh, we'll see what happens in the future. I've lost track of how many times I've rebuilt Cecil due to save corruption and now a platform jump, so his stats have moved around a bit since the first episode, uh, but they're still pretty close to what he uh, had last episode. I've actually managed to gain an extra level from 6 to 7 and swapped out toughness for educated. Uh, the last big shift in points is an extra 20 points in lockpick, while shaving a few off of other stats to compensate because, well, I love to pick locks. Uh, with that out of the way, let's get back to the adventures in Repcon. Hey! Over here! Are you listening? Go to the big room on the east side of this building and take the metal staircase all the way up. And hurry. Who I am doesn't matter, smooth skin. Stop wasting time and get up here. Stop wasting time. After those initial directions from a voice over the intercom, we get a chance to survey our surroundings a bit. Like uh, much of the wastes, Repcon has seen better days, uh, but there's also evidence of a bit of a scuffle that occurred here. Uh, we see a dead ghoul dressed like some of the bright followers we've uh, found before, uh, complete with more energy weapons, along with a dead nightkin. Nightkin are a variation on the more common super mutant. Similar to their greener counterparts, Nightkin are former humans changed by the FEV, or Force Evolution Virus, making them bigger, stronger, and generally dumber. Nightkin are, or were, higher in the pecking order uh, from the Master's Army in Fallout 1, and would employ better weapons and uh, stealth boys, old world tech that uh, makes them virtually invisible. Overuse in the tech is actually what causes their skin to turn blue, as well as some interesting side effects we'll see later. While the voice on the intercom told us to hurry, it's uh, worth exploring the ruins, as there's quite a bit of loot to fill our bags with. Uh, remnants of the old world are generally profitable, after all. Uh, for the most part, it's a lot of scrap pieces uh, that can be used to make things like weapon repair kits. Uh, there is a hunting revolt that can be found at the uh, top safe as uh, well. All this while navigating the halls of feral pools. I don't think I've talked about the specifics of ghouls yet, uh, have I? These are another classification of mutants that you'll find around much of the Fallout universe, suffering from prolonged radiation sickness, causing a nasty case of skin degeneration. Uh, sort of a walking poster child for why you should always wear sunscreen. On the flip side, ghouls are generally very long-lived and can thrive in places with larger amounts of radiation than normal. They'll often speak with a rasp, uh, presumably burnt out vocal cords, and it's uh, common for them to refer to regular humans as smooth skins. Ghouls come in two flavors. Uh, some still retain most, if not all, their human brain functions, making them people more or less like you and me, minus the appearance, of course. Feral ghouls, on the other hand, uh, which we've been punching on the way here, are just what they sound like, mindless animals living mostly on instinct. These are closer to the typical zombies that you see in a lot of fiction, and will usually shriek at you before attacking. They rarely carry anything valuable on them, and can often be traveling in packs. Uh, moving around the facility, we'll find our fair share of the feral variety. Alright, smooth skin, I'm letting you in. You better watch yourself. I'll sure as hell be watching you. God, but are you ugly. Get upstairs and talk to Jason before I throw up just from looking at you. Your pranks won't work on me, smooth skin. They won't work on Jason either. 
Stop wasting my time, smooth skin. Go waste Jason's. For our Fallout 3 players, it's uh, natural to assume that the voice that we heard earlier was that of uh, ghouls. Uh, but we see that Chris Haverson still has his skin intact. Why he's calling us smooth skins, though, we'll find out later. Uh, if we look around the rest of the floor, we can see Sorry, some actual ghouls, dressed up in the same way talk that the dead ones we found before. Here. These would be the non-feral variety, and don't show any sort of aggression towards us. It's uh, here we'll meet the leader, Jason Bright. Hello, Wanderer. Please forgive us our humble surroundings. Our true home awaits us in the far beyond. Have you come to help us complete the great journey? So, more on ghouls. Glowing ones are typically a variety of the feral versions of ghouls that uh, have taken f on far more radiation, resulting in them, well, glowing. These guys are usually tougher, as well as have the ability to release radiation novas and hurt enemies and heal other ghouls. Uh, we normally only find these enemies feral, but uh, this is our first and, if I'm not mistaken, only case of a feral ghoul that is also intelligent. Uh, it's quite an interesting find, really. I am Jason Bright, the prophet of the Great Journey. The Great Journey. All the ghouls you see here are members of my flock. We wish to escape the barbarity of the wasteland especially the violence and bigotry of its human inhabitants. The Creator has promised to my flock a new land, a place of safety and healing, a paradise in the far beyond. Preparations for the Great Journey were nearly complete when the demons appeared. The demons appeared from nowhere, except it might be more accurate to say they never actually appeared at all. The demons are invisible. Where one of them stands, the most one sees is the air shimmering like sunlight on water. They set upon us as we were on our way to worship one morning. We had just entered the basement. My flock fought bravely and killed a few, but at such cost. Nearly half of us died or went missing. The rest of us retreated up here. One of the demons raved at us but they have not tried to attack us since. Still, their demonic presence brought all progress towards the great journey to a standstill. But now you have come. Once again, the Creator has sent a human to help us across a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. Praise the Creator. Bless you, Wanderer. Bless us all. As soon as the underground has been rid of demons, Preparations for the Great Journey can resume. This is the start of why I am not the biggest fan of this quest. We've gone from what started as a simple mop-up task to a more diplomatic mission. While it's still possible to just go gun crazy and kill Jason and his followers, it's not like they're actually harming anyone hey. and are quite courteous themselves for the most part. Well, except for maybe Chris. He's kind of a jerk. In short, Guilt makes me take the long route, which wouldn't be so bad, except in order to do this job the right way, we've got to go do an inordinate amount of backtracking. Uh, for now, we'll make our way to the basement, where there's supposed to be demons lurking about. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the environmental clues and the lore that I've been dispensing, you probably already know what's down there. Clearly, not all the Nightkin have been reduced to ash piles. To make matters worse, Edie's uh, enhanced sensors are showing uh, more on the map down here. If we head off to the left, however, we can see an ally pip on the radar, and uh, we'll run into this individual. What's that, Adler? We have a visitor. An assassin, more like. I say kill it, Adler, for safe sake. Hmm? Okay, Adler, I'll ask. Uh, hi, human. Why you come here? This one is another rarity, a non-hostile super mutant, but clearly not quite right in the head. 
I am in command of my faculties, in command of my troops. Antler guides me in all things, as I in turn guide my kin. Who is Antler? Who is Antler? Antler, a human asks about you. What do I tell it? All right. All right. Yes, yes, of course. Who Antler is not important to you. Antler wants that you deal with me. Me? I am devoted to Antler. But before Antler? Hmm. Captain once. Last name Davison. First name... Don't remember. I commanded a troop of Nikon, the Master's elite. A great honor. Very proud. Something happened. We wandered the desert. Life without Master was... hard. The other's minds going strange. Going crazy! As mentioned before, the vast majority of super mutants and nightkins were subservient to the Master, uh, the main antagonist of the original Fallout, uh, also known as Richard Moreau or Richard Gray. Uh, canonically, he meets his end at the hands of the Vault Dweller from combat or a nuclear blast or a conversation, uh, and later causes the super mutants to scatter uh, masterless across the waste. Here we can see that Davidson is suffering from what appears to be schizophrenia, or something similar, since the knight can lack a leader. Uh, so it turns out a cow skull will do in a pinch. But then, I found us new master! I found us Antler! Since then, everything's been going really well. A human who is friend to ghouls? Suspicious. You meet the ones upstairs. Antler used intercom, told them stay put, but they want to come down in basement anyways. I cannot allow. My kin are not right in head like I am. They attack you on sight. Ghouls too. They crazy. Your ghoul friends have to wait until you find what Antler brought us to get. Good. Antler brought us here for a reason. Why was that, Antler? Right. A, a piece of paper. Shipment invoice. Hundreds of stealth boys sent here a, a long time ago. But stealth boys must be in the one room. One we don't search yet. The one we can't search. A ghoul, but not squishy like others. This ghoul is tough. I thought Antler said, send my kin into that room, but three died. Ghoul is a crack shot, and set traps too. After I realized, I heard Antler wrong, so I locked the door to keep kin out, and wait for Antler to tell me what to do. Then, you come along. Antler says you are solution. Yes. Antler says we leave here as soon as we get stealth boys. Let me give you key. Antler had me lock the door. The ghoul inside, not expecting a human. Maybe he don't shoot you. Maybe he will. Once again, we're going to hold off on a rampage and instead try to fulfill Davidson's request and talk to another. Come and get it, you big dumb. Hey, you're not one of those things out there. Who the hell are you? And I bet he told you it's the Creator's will for you to risk your ass, instead of him, right? Well, good luck with that. I'd give you a hand, but no thanks. I may look like a corpse, but I'm partial to living. Harland here is quite the tough customer. I'm always reminded of some sort of Clint Eastwood character, but maybe that's just the ghoul growl talking. First off, I'm not trapped. This was a tactical choice, all right? I'm no match for those things out there. So I found a good defensive position, and I've been defending it, right? Oh, who am I fooling? I'm trapped. Name's Harland. Pleased to meet you. What happened was, I was escorting folks down to work when those things attacked us. Most of the fight was upstairs, but some folks panicked made for the basement, and I went after him. Well, 
Turns out there were even more of those bastards down here than upstairs. And things went to shit fast. I couldn't find the others. So I fell back to this room. Set up a nice little kill zone. End of story. Guess the outfit gives that away, huh? I never did buy into that religious mumbo-jumbo with the robes and all that shit. It gets lonely out in the wastes, okay? And I don't have to tell you, that Bright's group has got some fine-looking goulettes in it. Huh. Or maybe I would have to tell you. Anyway, I helped them out. And they kept me supplied with ammo and pleasant company. Huh. Well, you're polite. I'll give you that. If this was just between you and me, I'd do as you ask. But it's not. I had a friend with me when those mutant bastards came out of nowheres. She panicked and ran the wrong direction. Further into the basement, she's probably dead. But I ain't leaving until I know for sure. I'd have gone looking myself, except I wouldn't last a minute out there. You, on the other hand, seem pretty resourceful. Find my friend, and I'll get out of your way. Thanks. Let me know what you find out. Here's hoping she's okay. Uh, in order to get him to back off, we have to fulfill a request of his. Just to make sure you guys are following, this started out as trying to track down the guy who shot us in the head and stole our package. Manny Vargas knows where he went, but he won't tell us until we clear out all the ghouls from Repcon. The ghouls squatting on the second floor won't leave until their great journey, and they can't do that while there are nightkin in the basement. Davidson, the nightkin leader, won't leave with his thrall until they get their stealth boys locked away in the room with Harland. Harland won't leave until we find out if his sexy ghoul lady is still alive or not, and in the house that Jack built. Whew. So instead of going into a homicidal rage, we're going to try to sneak around the invisible super mutants. Telling companions to stay put can be handy if you're trying the stealth approach, and the companion wheel does make it easier than it was in 3. Uh, fortunately for us, we've managed to acquire a few stealth boys, which gives us a maxed out stealth and cloaking field for the duration. Uh, extremely handy item, especially if you're a thief or a pacifist. Further into the winding maze that is the Repcon basement, we'll find what uh, looks sort of like a makeshift jailing area. Uh, if you look closely, you can actually see the Predator-esque outline of the jailer in the area. We'll need his key to progress further, although there is the alternative of scrounging up a key and a desk, um, but instead I decide to attack him while he's cloaked. The other huge advantage of Stealth Boys is that it more or less guarantees you'll be getting sneak attack crits. find what's left of the unfortunate lady ghoul in one of the cell areas. Uh, we don't actually need the proof from the body or anything, just visual verification. Uh, the game won't let us lie to Harland, he's just scripted to take our word once we see the body. Did you find my friend? I see. Well, spare me the details. Damn it. I'm gonna miss that crooked yellow smile. Alright. You did your part. So I'll do mine. Look around up here if you want. I'm gonna make a break for topside. A little bit of navigation around some traps and we can see a bunch of boxes next to the terminal. All empty. Checking the terminal, we see that there was indeed a large shipment of stealth boys to the facility. In fact, some of the workers had a little fun with them. Uh, but they were eventually shipped back. Antler sings for stealth boys. Have you found them? Liar! The envoy said stealth boys here. Antler read it out loud to me. But invoice note said stealth boys were here. Why can't that note be true? What, Antler? But human could be lying. He's stealing the stealth boys for itself. Oh, Antler, you trust so easy. 
Your lucky day, human. Antler believe you. Nightkin will follow the new note to find stealth boys. Better be there. Despite not having what Davidson was looking for, a little backup from Antler is all we need in order to turn the rest of the Nightkin docile. Uh, they'll peaceably go and roam the waste. It's worth noting that this quest has a tendency to randomly make Davidson turn hostile on you. Uh, it seems like the game will allow you to kill one or two of the Nightkin roaming the halls, uh, but more than that, he'll attack. It's finicky on what the actual conditions are, however. Anyway, back up two floors to go tell Jason. This place needs an elevator. Is the way clear? Praise the Creator, and bless you, Wanderer. The way is clear. I will lead my flock through the basement to the sacred site. I hope you will come find us there, Wanderer. There is much to be done. Anyway, back down two floors to get ready for the great journey. This place really needs an elevator. I waited to speak with you one last time before I descended to the launch pad, Wanderer. I want you to know that we will remember for all eternity how you delivered us to the threshold of the Great Journey. Our preparations are nearly complete, but the rockets that will carry us to salvation are yet missing vital components. If you would still help us, Wanderer, speak to Chris. He can tell you what is missing. So that warm place full of healing and radiation is looking more and more to be the sun. Harlan doesn't get the lady, Nightkins don't get stealth boys, and Jason Bright and his followers are just doing their best Covenant impression from Halo. Kind of a sick joke if you think about it for too long. Uh, there are two more items we'll need to continue the quest. Jason says that I am to cooperate with you on the final tasks necessary to launch the Great Journey. Two components were missing. A quantity of Isotope 239 igniting agent, and a set of thrust control modules. Lucky for us, it turns out those rockets models from the Dynabite gift shop uh, that we stole actually have the isotope in them for some reason. So really, all we have to do is get thrust controls. Yes, that's isotope 239, all right. And there's enough here to launch the rockets. Now all I need is the thrust control modules. There is a ladder to the wasteland down here, so we do get a bit of a shortcut. Now that we can fast travel, we're going to go visit the Gibson scrapyard just north to Novak. It's been mentioned uh, before that lots of scavenging has already been done in Repcon, uh, so this is as good a place as any. Further off in the distance behind the scrapyard is a peculiarly shaped building, the Helios 1 solar station. Uh, we won't be going to it this episode, but it's on the list of places to visit. The scrapyard itself is relatively modest. Old Lady Gibson has four dogs keeping her company, as well as a hey. handful of scrap that can be bought. Hi there! I'm Old Lady Gibson, or so they tell me. I've got odds and ends for sale, and I'm pretty good at fixing things, too. You have to ask specifically about thrust controls. As it so happens, I do have some thrust modules, but they're expensive. 500 caps worth of expensive. 50 barter or speech you can get them for half off. This check is pretty easy to meet with skill magazines, so you can essentially take a 20 cap investment and save more than 10 times that amount. Or you can just break into the back room and steal the controls. We'll buy them this time. Pleasure doing business with you. Also of note, dialogue with Miss Gibson triggers the beginning of the companion quest for Edie. Subject E, diagnosis complete. Begin recording. My name is Whitley. I'm a researcher at Adams Air Force Base. Until recently, I was in charge of the Duraframe reinforcement project for the combat model iBots. iBot Duraframe Subject E is both the prototype and the last functional model in this test group. I was prepared to make several significant upgrades to the machines. However, as the project was canceled and all Duraframe assets are being diverted to Hellfire Armor, I am sending this model to the Navarro outpost. If you're listening to this log from one of our Enclave outposts in Chicago, give this unit whatever repairs it needs so it can continue to Navarro. There's a lot of little lore bits to be gathered in the playback message. 
Adams Air Force Base was the climactic showdown spot for the Broken Steel DLC of Fallout 3, and the locations mentioned suggest that there are or were enclave outposts located in Chicago and in Navarro. As it stands, we can't do anything to advance this place now, so we'll have to wait for more audio logs later. Time to go back to Repcon. Hey there. Have you found the components we discussed? Indeed you did. And they seem to be in excellent condition. Yes. I'll tell Jason that the great journey can begin. After delivering the controls, it looks like the ghouls will finally be ready to activate the Halo installation. I mean, jump in their rocket. We have everything we need to launch the rockets, Jason. The great journey can begin. The time has come for us to board the rockets and begin the great journey. Though it may seem that all humans despise us, the Creator has seen fit to instruct us differently. The journey ahead would have been impossible if not for the intercession of two human friends, one you, the other a long-abiding companion. To our new friend, we say thanks and promise never to forget how he cleared from our path the demons who sought to stay our journey. But to Chris, we owe more than thanks. Chris, you have made this great journey a reality. From this moment forward, you will be remembered as the saint of the great journey. We shall never forget you. I ask that you forgive us, Chris, and give us your blessing. And we bestow ours upon you. Seekers, board the rockets. Take your seats. The great journey awaits. To the promised land we go. To the far beyond. There's just the issue of Chris to deal with, who will finally come to grips with his beautiful skin after Bright's farewell speech. Did you hear him? My God, you were right all along. I'm no ghoul. They were just using me. Dying would be worse than this? Used up and thrown away like garbage? Oh, so I've redeemed the human race, is that it? What a crock. The human race can't stand me. So, you want me to accompany you on your adventures across the wasteland, is that it? Life among humans again? That's what you're suggesting? I guess... I guess it's the only chance I've got. Maybe it'll be different this time. I was never a saint before. I can't believe I'm agreeing to this, but I'll give it a try. You go launch the rockets. I'm on my way to Novak. Anyway, go back up two floors to launch the rockets. This place really needs an elevator. Up here, all you need to do is throw the switch. You can get a little extra XP and karma by adjusting the rocket's flight path or causing them to crash into each other. Your choice. to get a level up after all this nonsense. Uh, we'll also be able to pick up the Cowboy Perk, a core component to our build. 25% more damage with six shooters and lever weapons. Fun times. The final frustration after all of this is that we have to take the long way down out of Repcon despite more or less being outside. Back in Novak, we'll report in with Manny and get our next lead on the shooter. You have any luck with the ghouls? 
I'm counting on you. Really? Unbelievable, man. I knew that wasn't gonna be easy. But I had a good feeling about you. You look like you've been through a lot. Okay, I'll tell you everything I know, like I promised. The guy you're looking for, Benny, he was traveling with some members from my old gang. They were going to Boulder City. No clue. I know Benny hadn't paid up yet. Maybe that was where they were supposed to get square. It's straight up Route 93 from here. Just keep following the road north. Hope that helps. I owed ya. Yeah, see ya. It's a good thing for Mandy that I'm such a sucker for XP.